Good afternoon and welcome to the first edition of ArcView Explorers, where we will take you, the audience, behind the scenes of some of the most well-known cannabis companies in the space. I'm Sarah Falvo, Manager of Member Experience here at the ArcView Group. Today, we'll be visiting with Canisafe, the world's first ISO-accredited cannabis testing lab. Aaron Riley, owner and CEO of Canisafe, will be walking us through the history and the story of the lab as well as highlighting some new and exciting things going on at the facility. We'll also have a Q&A at the end of the program, so please post any questions you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Without further ado, let me introduce Aaron Riley, who will take it from here and tell us about the CanSafe story. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to CannaSafe. My name is Aaron Riley, and I'd like to thank ArcView for having us. This is a cool opportunity um, in light of COVID and the other worldly circumstances. I know, you know, many of you would like the opportunity to come visit the lab, and that's something that we commonly do. And, and this is a great advancement in technology that's going to allow us to kind of show off our laboratory and also share our story. Um, so I'm going to start with the history of CannaSafe, and then we're going to play a nice video that has Danny walking through the lab explaining the rooms, follow up with some questions and uh, a unique test that we offer in the cannabis space. Uh, so CannaSafe was founded in 2011. It was founded by Matt and Randy Haskin, father-son duo. Randy's daughter had Crohn's disease and that was kind of the whole idea behind CannaSafe was there was, there was only, I think, two labs at the time, none of them in SoCal, and they wanted to really find out what was in the medicine that they were providing. Um, so that was how CannaSafe came to be. 2012 was a significant year in milestone for, for CannaSafe. We became the world's first ISO accredited cannabis laboratory. Funny story in that regard is we called the third party accrediting agency and said, hey, we want you to come out and get accredited to, to, you know, to get us accredited for testing cannabis. They laughed and hung up. It actually took six months for them to agree to come schedule an audit. Um, and the argument was is the, the accrediting bodies don't actually accredit what you're testing, they accredit your processes. So testing cannabis or grapes or tomato, the accrediting process is all the same, just about what you're testing. So an example of early overcoming the stigma associated with the cannabis industry. Um, but since 2012, we've maintained our accreditation. I was personally got involved in 2016. I took over the majority of the business. Um, and from that point on, it's been off to the races. Um, in 2016, we were in Marietta, Temecula, California. Uh, the laboratory was in a 10 by 10 room. We had two instruments. Um, you know, I showed up overly ambitious, not knowing what an HPLC was or any of the other laboratory equipment um, and got to some steadfast learning. In early 2017, we moved the laboratory to the Santa Isabel Indian Reservation. It's, in, it's on, on the border of San Diego County. And this was a significant experience because it gave me my first foray into designing a lab to accommodate workflow, to be able to perform the additional testing that was continued to be required like heavy metals um, and other assays. And I also learned how not to set up a lab, fortunately on a small scale. <clears throat> One of the things that we did in that laboratory space is we did the high times cannabis cup testing and they would drop off 400 samples and then with one back in three or four days and my thought process behind that was this is what every day is going to look like we're going to have to be able to process 400 samples we're going to have to move it through the, the seven to nine different tests that are required for every um, production batch and we're going to have to do it efficiently and that was kind of the inspiration behind what we have here in la is we have a facility that's capable of doing up to 500 compliance tests a day which when you break down the individual tests, it's between you know, 3,500 and 4,000 individual tests a day. Um, so after that San Isabel experience, we, I found a location in Los Angeles just under 13,000 square feet, and we designed a laboratory from scratch that could accommodate that type of workflow that had all of the infrastructure support for expansion within the instruments, within all the prep that was coming. Um, and that was kind of how we got to this LA facility. Um, in terms of our growth, my first year at the company, we did 2016, we did $150,000 in revenue. Um, last year we did 19.6 million. So we've had rocket boosters in terms of um, you know, growth. We're, one, we're actually submitted for the Inc. 500 list this year. Um, and we expect to be among the top 
you know, 15 to 25 fastest growing businesses in America. Um, our facility in LA is, is 12,500 square feet. We have almost 40 set, 40 instruments. We have four, four complete sets of instrumentation. Some of the testing that's required in LA is um, obviously potency, cannabinoids, terpenes, solvents, heavy metals, pesticides, corn matter, um, water activity, moisture. And then there's some other testing that we do that's specialized to us. We do, you know, we were the, we were the first lab to get accredited cannabis to do the vitamin E acetate testing, uh, which broke with the vape crisis last year. We do stability shelf life testing. Uh, we have certain clients that uh, contract us to do one-off product projects for R&D testing. Maybe it's a specific terpene or cannabinoid that they want to do some research on. Um, so next up, I'm going to segue into our lab tour. Dan, this is a pretty pre-recorded video from Danny. She's much better looking than myself. Um, and she's going to walk you guys to the lab and then we're going to bounce back and cover a little bit more of a specific test we offer and go into the Q&A segment. Hey Welcome to CannaSafe in LA. My name's Danny. Today I'm going to give you a tour of the lab. Let's get started. This is our intake department, the largest department at CannaSafe, first stop for every sample entering our lab. This is where the product is entered into our system, photographed, and then labeled before we head off into homogeneity. For compliance testing, we're required to take 0.35% of your finished harvest batch. Homogenization is the process of blending that entire sample size together so we know it's indicative of that batch's entirety. After samples pass through homogeneity, they're sent down to our open prep area. This space has been subdivided per assay and was designed for efficiency and flow. After the samples are prepped, they're sent to their respective assays. This is our microbials assay. It's a clean room that's sectioned off from the rest of the lab. In this room, we're testing for microbial contaminants, which consist of four different strains of aspergillus mold, salmonella, and shiga toxin producing E. coli. We utilize qPCR technology, which measures the DNA growth of those analytes. Our Hamilton liquid handler assists us in some of our automated steps increasing consistency and accuracy in our results. You are now entering our volatile compounds assay. In this room, we're testing for residual solvents and terpenoids. At CannaSafe, we test for 21 major terpenes found in cannabis cultivars. Through the use of our GCFID, which uses a GC headspace and a flame ionization detector, we're able to analyze and detect the aromatic compounds found within your cannabis product. This is our heavy metals assay. Cannabis is a major bioaccumulator, which means it absorbs everything in its environment. In this room, we're testing for the big four heavy metals, cadmium, arsenic, mercury, and lead. To do this, the sample is first sent through our digester. We then send it through our ICPMS, or inductively coupled plasma mass spec. There's three states of matter, gas, liquid, and solid. If we keep adding heat to that gas, it becomes plasma. That's what we're doing in our ICPMS to break the sample down to its simplest form and begin testing those big four heavy metals. We have now entered one of our most heavily utilized rooms because we're conducting our potency analysis and our pesticide analysis in this room. Not just one instrument can detect all 66 pesticides. That's why we use our GCMS and LCMS to conduct our pesticide analysis. Quality control is extremely important to us. On this instrument, the circular set of vials are all quality control vials that run intermittently between our order vials. This is our LCMS. It's our most sensitive piece of instrumentation here at the lab. It can detect certain pesticides down to the part per billion. This is the CannaSafe potency department. Here in this department, it's our job to determine the cannabinoid profile of any sample that enters the lab. To do this, the sample is first placed on one of our Agilent 1290 high performance liquid chromatography instruments. The sample is then injected via an auto sampler and sent through one of the separation columns within the instrument. That's how we conduct potency here at CannaSafe. 
Once the assays submit their peer review data, it's then reviewed again by our quality team to ensure your COA results are accurate and representative of your sample. Compliance testing is paramount in ensuring consumer safety and pushing the cannabis industry forward. Always remember to shop at a licensed dispensary and ask your bud tender for a certificate of analysis. Well, that was great. Thank you so much for showing that us to us, Erin. We'd love to hear what else is going on in terms of new equipment and methods at CanSafe. Is that something you can walk us through? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Unmuted. That's good. good to go. Not and clear. Yep. Thanks guys. Yeah, thank you for that intro, Sarah. Yeah, as you guys can see, you know, you got to see some of our lab. Danny did a great job showing off, you know, kind of our instrumentation, the, the flow of samples through the process. Um, I'm excited to show you guys here one thing that we're offering right now that's exclusive to us in cannabis testing in California, and that's stability chambers and stability testing. Um, why is this significant? Well, first of all, it's required in almost any other type of food or ingestible industry is knowing what kind of shelf life your products have for cannabis, especially with the stringent safety requirements, is do, your, do the products manufactured, do they hold true to those safety testing to, uh, to stand the test of time? For instance, um, does, your, does your vape cartridges leach heavy metal over six to nine months or 12 months, or are they good up to a year? Those are all important things to know um, for manufacturers. So here we have the carbon environmental can you guys see the, the stability chambers? And basically what you're doing is you're accelerating six months of, of what would be six months of shelf life time down to six weeks. Um, and throughout that process, you know, we uh, basically two weeks is two and a half weeks around there is a month, depending on which type of pressure, uh, humidity and temperature settings that you choose to do your study at. But you can find out within a relatively short order of time how well your products are gonna hold up. There's a few cannabis brands that are, cannabis and CBD brands that are ahead of the curve. And they've already started doing this type of testing on their products to get an idea of what happens to their products on the shelf. Do they leach heavy metals? Do they leach any other contaminants? What kind of degradation are they seeing to cannabinoids over that process? Um, so we're actually getting some pretty cool data. We're hoping towards the end of this year that one of our clients is willing to kind of share what they've been up to and what they've been working on because it's very cool. Uh, one of the things about stability testing is it's currently not a requirement in for cannabis testing in California. And history has taught us that anything that's not a requirement is very seldomly done. Um, so I'm always encouraging, you know, our clients to get to stay ahead of the curve. And that's one thing where, you know, as the laboratories that we've always done is we've always offered testing that we feel like is going to come into regulations. California phased on you know, they had three time, three points in time when they phased in regulations, um, and most other labs struggled and took took the maximum lot of time to get those tests up and running. Whereas we came to the market early and had all of the applicable tests available, um, you know, almost a year before they were required, and we were able to help a lot of our clients navigate through those regulations because we had already had experience testing them, and we had already seen you know where there were cause for concern in terms of product types packaging types, hardware types, et cetera. So I'm gonna send it back to you, Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. And honestly, as a consumer, it's great to know just all the detail that goes on to ensure that all the products on the shelf are safe. Rigorous testing and benchmark standards are definitely one of the biggest differentiators between the legal and the illicit markets. And I think it's just so important to hammer home the point that you should be consuming tested products. And I think that's just one of the most important points in the industry um, going forward. So I'm glad that you're here and you can do all of that for us. So now we're gonna go to the Q&A portion. Um, we have a number of questions that we would love your input on. Uh, and also for the audience, if you have additional questions, once again, feel free to drop them into the Q&A bucket down at the bottom of your screen. But let me just start 
with this one, Erin. So what is in the future for CanaSafe? Do you have any plans for expansion? Erin, you there? <laughs> I think we may. There we go. I'm All right. There, yeah, sorry. Okay. No, <laughs> hey, technical difficulties. We live in a brand new world, everyone. So thank you for being patient with us. So I'm not sure if you heard, but what's in the future for CanaSafe? Any plans for expansion? And I'd also love for you to touch upon maybe, you know, the thought of expanding into other states and things like that. Absolutely. Yes. So in terms of expansion, currently we are expanding in Oregon and Florida, we have locations. Oregon is finalized and complete. There's been a little bit of a delay because of COVID for the governing agency to come out and do our accreditation. Um, so that's, Oregon's pretty much other than that, ready to go. Uh, Florida, we've started construction. We're excited. They're just, they just upped the requirement for testing in Florida. We feel like there's a strong chance that it goes recreational next year. Um, and there's gonna be a benefit of the growth way. We also have recognized that there's limited competition in that market. So yes, we're currently in the process of expanding. There's several other deals that are in the pipeline that, that we have yet to negotiate. Uh, we've kind of identified our internal scope and criteria for markets that we want to go to. Um, interesting enough, everyone always asks, is it is the biggest market the best place to be? Um, in terms of California, that is true because California is, is very heavily regulated. But Colorado, which is probably the second largest market at the time, is, is actually one of the worst markets to be in as a testing lab because of the very limited requirements. People can test one batch a year rather than in California where they have to fetch a, test a batch every time they produce it. Um, and it, tying back into your comment in terms of consumer safety, that's actually one of the worst states for, for product safety and rigor because I think that there's been recent articles about the bold problem in Colorado. Um, and it's, you know, there's a ton of problems. Producers can submit their own samples in Colorado versus California where we have to go and collect the sample in this random package, um, et cetera. So yeah, lots of expansion for us. We're very excited. This is gonna be the first time too that we you know, solicit outside investment in, in the company. That's great. And so let me ask you this too, since each state is so different in terms of regulations, how do you kind of overcome that setting up shop in new states? Like how do you, you know, get all of that information? How much does it differentiate from state to day, state and how does that affect your standardization from your end? Got it. Yeah, it's definitely a difficult task and it's one that nobody has been successful with yet. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge that we're willing to undertake. Uh, our philosophy to this point, even in California, has been to drive our operation through quality control. Um, and that's an approach that we're going to take as we enter these new markets where they might have a different type of way that you have to test a certain product, or they might have a different pesticide list. But if we have the same quality, if we have the same standard of quality control and procedure control, then we're going to be all right. We're going to be able to navigate the nuances with, within the regulatory rather than focusing on recreating or, or creating new science for every market. If we have a strong core base and quality, we'll be able to figure out all the regulations. And in terms of, in terms of all the markets, California is by far the most stringent and it has the most volume. So, you know, we're very fortunate to, to have conducted hundreds of thousands of tests um, and have the experience of doing all those tests. So nuances that might be, uh, you know, burdensome for other companies that are new to cannabis testing or new to the market aren't going to be so to us. We have experience with the science, the people, scaling, et cetera. Great. And, you know, doing so many tests throughout the years, what has been the most interesting thing that's come through your doors to test that maybe hasn't gone on market or something like that? Yeah, so this is a funny question because people are always curious, like what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen? Um, and my answer is actually, it's kind of funny because we're actually now seeing it come back around. But when I first started, somebody brought in beef jerky, like infused beef jerky in order to <laughs> You know, I haven't seen that on the market I yet. I, yeah, I don't know that I would want to eat beef jerky as an edible. I might want to eat an edible and then eat a beef jerky. Um, but, you know, ironically enough, there's actually somebody that's manufacturing beef jerky compliantly now. This was, you know, when I first saw it, it was several years ago. It was for a High Times Festival. And I never thought that it would be something that would be going to market. But that, that's definitely the, the weirdest thing I've seen so far. I love that. 
Um, we have a question from Stephen Greenfield. He is asking, do you also do CBD testing? And have you done shelf life tests with CBD yet? Hi, Stephen. Yes, we do CBD testing. Um, there isn't yet any requirements for the CBD market. So it's probably, I would say, two to 5% of our overall business is CBD and hemp testing. So it's still a relatively small portion. Um, in terms of shelf life and stability, we have cannabis clients that make CBD products that have undergone shelf life and stability testing. And I would say that it's actually more important from, from the data that we've collected so far, it's actually more important for the CBD clients because it is less stable than THC. Um, degradation occurs faster. It's a more, it's a more sensitive cannabinoid. Um, you deal with more loss and at a pretty rapid amount. So. Great. And then we have a question from Ned Davis, and this is in regards to logistics. How are field samples of plant material from distant locations sent to the lab? How is chain of title maintained? Got it. Yeah. So one of the things that we had to figure out early on in California was the logistics. We're located in LA. We want to service the entire state. So we've built up a team of 15 that handles all of our logistics and coordination all the way from Humboldt and NorCal to San Diego. Every day we have drivers picking up from almost every geographical area in the state. Uh, we, we found that it was actually better to hire local drivers that can pick up and then pass them off to to uh, transporters and our dispatcher kind of handles all the logistics. So every day it's, it's pretty cool to see on the map. We have a software that shows where all the drivers are going all over the state who drove the most miles and they all end up back in LA at the end of the night. So it's pretty cool to see. And then in terms of chain of custody um, for compliance samples, it's very paperwork intensive. We've built our own software to digitize a lot of the paperwork and also reduce the errors made from inputting batch IDs or metric tags. Um, so that really helps us maintain the chain of custody. And within our ISO break, within our ISO accreditation and the regulations, we have to have chain of custody. So we know who picked up what sample, we know what time they picked it up. There's a picture on our end of picking it up. There's uh, somebody, we have a verifier who verifies every, every pickup we do, they verify actually via FaceTime on our iPads that the person picked up, you know, if it says they picked up 15 samples, that they picked up 15 samples. So they verify a photo of it, it goes back to lab, it's logged in as soon as it hits the lab, whoever logs it in signs off on it. So we're very heavy and intense in terms of quality and chain of custody. That's great. And I think, you know, all those additional steps and details really is important at this time, just in this space, in this industry. I mean, you have to be on top of everything. So this question is actually from our CEO, Kim. So with the vaping issue, I had heard that the amount of lead in particular was found double or triple allowable limits after six months for some hardware. Are you seeing this? And do you think this could be part of a mandated testing in the future? Hi, Kim, great question. Yes, we are seeing this and it's actually, you know, the, the one company that's done the most shelf life testing, they actually have their own hardware uh, division of the business and they sell a vape product. Um, and they've tested their own, their, their product actually stands the test of time and they tested some of their competitors um, and they would have significant amounts of problems if the state required you know, six month or 12 month shelf life study. So I think that as, as the regulators become more educated and the market becomes more mature, that, that we're certainly going to see uh, some sort of hardware test that is conducted in the future. And yes, there is a significant amount of lead leaching um, from some insert hardware manufacturers. Great. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Claire Erickson is asking, it's common knowledge that many brands purchase lab results. How can reputable labs start working together to eliminate this dubious practice without industry repercussions? That is a great point. That is something that we're working on. You know, people, people ask if we've been impacted by COVID and uh, we've been impacted somewhat, but the biggest extent of the impact has been that the BCC has been stuck in Sacramento and hasn't been checking on our dubious competitors. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is we have formed a lab group you know, personally, I feel there's only several labs in the state that are up with the quality control and the requirements required to, to hold the high standard of quality regulations and ethics. Um, so we're forming a lab group and within that lab group, we're making suggestions to the state for things like a round robin testing where 
all of the labs participated and they test the same sample for potency and they test the same sample for pesticide. Um, and it, it'll become, you know, the, the whole intention isn't to, to, you know, put people out of business, but it's to say, hey, if you're having a pesticide problem or if you're having a potency problem, you need to stop reporting samples and you need to figure it out because we all need to be aligned here. Because that's, you know, that's the worst thing for all of us. Anything bad that happens in this industry, especially on the license side, makes all of the licensed operators look bad. So if something bad happens, if some other lab gets shut down, if something bad happens, it makes everybody look bad. Um, you know, we're, we're all in this together in terms of trying to overcome a stigma that has, you know, been 50, 60 years in the making. Um, and for us to all do it with integrity, ethics, and good moral standard is, is, is what it's going to require to really change the perception of the public. And that's one of the things that we all need to work on. I totally agree. Um, so tell me, how long does it take to get a sample tested from pickup from the producer to approval or rejection? What does that timeline typically look like? I'm sure it's probably different for different products, but can you walk us through that a little bit? Absolutely. So we always shoot for three to five day turnaround time. We have rush, rush options. It's really test dependent. Um, in terms of if we had a sample right now in the lab, we need to test it. And it was the biggest priority in the world. We actually have a, a rush surcharge called the showstopper for people that are having an, having an emergency type situation. You're looking at about two to three hours for one test to be done. If we have a sample, it's ready to go. Um, in terms of when we pick something up, uh, that, and that's all of our chemical tests, with the exception of microbial. Microbial takes 48 hours. So it's, it, you, know, you have to go through an incubation period, it takes two days. Um, in terms of a compliance sample, if we pick it up at Monday at 9 a.m., um, and it goes straight to the lab. The soonest that somebody could get it would be uh, you know, Tuesday evening at, at about 9 p.m. Um, so end of day. And that's really, really fast. Typically, we're around the three, three to four day kind of range. It's kind of our ideal sweet spot. That's great. And then Teresa Autry is asking, is your lab strictly for the state of California or do you do testing for all legal states? Yeah, hi, Teresa. So, we do, we do CBD testing across the country and, and internationally. We actually have a very large British company that's one of the top fragrance and beauty companies in the world as a client of ours, and they're doing CBD and checking out all their topicals. So on the CBD hemp front, we service the entire world. Um, on the cannabis front, currently we're exclusive to California with this location, uh, with our locations in Oregon and Florida and the other states that are Online, we will be servicing those local cannabis markets. Great. And one day, one day, all the borders will open and then we can do all of this without being so localized. Um, this question is from Gerald Katarina. What happens to the batch if it fails? What techniques are available to clean the flower and what is the cost typically? Got it. Yeah, so there's, there's a certain number of different fails that could occur and their potential outcome you know a simple one example is a label claim if uh, like for instance if an edible isn't within 10 percent if it says 100 milligrams and the edible comes out and it's not within 10 percent of 100 milligrams they can re-sticker that batch so it's not it's really just a you know it's a lot of manual labor on their part whereas like if a flower sample fails for mold um the state has this remediation process where you can remediate a batch up to two times uh, mold is something where you could either do eradicate or eradication um, or you could do ozone treatment to it and those those two processes we've seen are you know, different levels of effectiveness depending on the level of contamination um, they also contribute to different levels of degradation in the product some of them are you know tougher than others i've, I've heard that ozone is harder, harder than um, the eradication technique um, and in terms of oil products um, you can, there's people that use flash chromatography to remediate pesticides out of play. Basically, they're isolating those compounds and removing them from the, the batches. But typically, in terms of oil, we'll see that before. If somebody fills 2,000 bake carts with uh, oil that's contaminated with pesticides, often it's not worth it to go and take all those carts apart and then do remediation treatment. Uh, flour is something commonly remediated whenever there's a mold issue, um, kind of dependent on the batch size. Great. Now that's super helpful. 
So just a couple more questions and then we'll wrap things up. But um, I've heard that Canada Safe has a social equity program. So I'd act, actually love for you to just tell us a little about, bit about that and explain what you're doing in that regard. Awesome. Yeah, that's something that we're very proud of and happy about. Um, that's one of our missions is to be a great place to work, but also to be a, a great uh, business in the local community. Um, I personally have been arrested for cannabis. I was in 2011. So a lot of what we do is expungement focused. It's giving back to people that, that, that are due that second opportunity that have had undue consequences of participating in the cannabis industry too early. Um, Antonio Frazier, who's my right man, right hand man, he's a minority. Um, he's dealt with, you know, the, the racial injustice drawn on cannabis. So that's another large proponent of what we do. Um, you know, the African American demographic has been disproportionately affected by cannabis and continues to do so. Um, so that's, you know, that's another focus of ours. Um, and like, you know, in 2019, we gave away over hundred thousand dollars to the expungement clinics. Americans for Safe Access actually nominated us as Business Advocates of the Year, um, and that's something that we that we plan on continuing to drive, especially as we go to new markets. Um, is really being present and giving back to those communities that we're in. That's fantastic. So just to wrap things up, I know that you said you were looking for investors um, earlier. So if someone's interested in connecting with you, what's the best way? I mean, also for the audience, if you're interested in connecting, we can always forward messages to Aaron and his team as well. But um, is there anything else you'd like to say in terms of capital raising or things like that? Yeah, so we've kind of just started the process. We are going to be looking for some new capital partners. We're looking you know, at investment banks, so looking at private equity. We, we do plan on finding a lead investor and then opening up to a little bit larger of a group. Um, I would suggest for people on this call to reach out through Sarah and the ArcView team in terms of getting in touch with me, but I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, you can try to call our office, but good luck getting through. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're looking, you know, we haven't really brought in outside capital to this point. We feel like right now is a significant opportunity given kind of our path and trajectory. Um, we, I always go to people and say that we're the best of the worst. Um, and, you know, being in, being that we're in such a super high growth space, we have a very unique opportunity to continue to kind of lead, you know, lead a, a new business that's never been done before. You know, we're not competing against Eurofin or these multi-billion dollar organizations. We're competing against people that are figuring out how to test beef jerky that has cannabis oil and juice in it. <laughs> I love it. And I think you need to put that on a shirt. <laughs> Best of the worst. <laughs> Best of the worst. That's us. Whenever it can plot, whenever we have anybody, when you, whenever we have anybody complain, I always tell them, "Hey, we're the best of the worst." But <laughs> I love it. Well, Aaron, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I've known you for a couple of years. It's great, you know, continuing to partner with you. Um, and thank you for your time and your answers and being candid about things. So we really appreciate that. Um, so to wrap things up, we're going to have a poll. Um, it's going to pop up shortly on your screen. We would appreciate your input as we strive to continue to offer the best programming um, experience for everyone. And I just have a few other things that I want to share. So if you enjoyed today's tour, please make sure to check out our next one on Thursday, July 16th with 1906, where we will get a Willy Wonka-like tour on how technology and creativity partner to make some fantastic edibles. The ArcView group has also recently launched two additional membership levels, the Discovery Membership and the Women's Investor Network, also known as WIN, membership. This allows individuals to start to experience all that the ArcView ecosystem has to offer. Additionally, if you're an investor member, please make sure to check out our upcoming ArcView Access Elite webinar next Wednesday, July 8th, where three cannabis companies will take the virtual stage to pitch to our investor audience. And alternating with the investor webinars, we also have bi-weekly public webinars, with the next one focusing on the international cannabis industry on July 15th. And if you're interested in becoming a member, please reach out to sales at arcviewgroup.com. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you next time. And be sure to keep an eye out on all the great things that Arcview is continuing to do. All right, thanks. Bye.